Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, we're very happy to have Colin Lowe speak this week. So Colin Lowe is currently uh, a lecturer at uh, Cambridge, which we began this uh, this year. Before that, she was visiting professor at Columbia University, and before that, an assistant associate professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison, um, and an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, for that, she did her PhD um, in Berkeley. She's going to talk to us today about robust WGAN based estimation under mass assigned contamination. So please uh, start. Hey, yeah, thanks a lot, Matt. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, it's great to see lots of familiar names and faces from all over the world and also the crew at Isaac Newton Institute. Um, so I'll be talking about some recent work with a PhD student of mine, Jung Liu, and it has to do with, um, with robust estimation under Wasserstein contamination um, using neural networks as a method for dealing with um, usual computational intractability of these estimators. Okay. So just a very brief um, one slide introduction to robust estimation. Um, generally speaking, um, for robust estimation, we want to design estimators that perform well, even under some sort of perturbations to an idealized model. Um, so just as a kind of warm up example, um, if you want to uh, do mean estimation from a normal location family, so let's say that you have IID observations from a normal distribution with mean theta and known variance one, um, then the maximum likelihood estimator would be the sample mean. Um, however, when you have a setting in which um, you have slightly contaminated data, where here we're looking at a mixture distribution, which with probability one minus epsilon, the data are drawn from a normal theta one distribution, but with probability epsilon, they're drawn from some contamination um, delta mass sitting at point X. Then you can see under different sorts of robustness metrics that an estimator such as the sample mean will do quite badly Whereas an estimator like the sample median, um, although it might lose some efficiency when you have clean data, um, will perform better under perturbations. Um, and another sort of theme throughout this talk is that um, it, there's, it, it's one question to come up with an estimator which performs well. Um, it's another to come up with an estimator that can be computed efficiently and also performs optimally or near optimally. So in, on, the, on the previous slide, I had, um, uh, I had this example of drawing data from a contaminated mixture. And classically in robust statistics, this is known as um, Huber's epsilon contamination model. So um, it's a very natural idea that instead of just drawing data from a clean distribution F, you draw data that's from some mixture of F and, and G, which, where before G was um, a delta mass. Um, you could also ask, well, what are some other metrics um, on, on the space of distributions that one might use to define these balls of contamination? So it could be that an estimator performs well under one sort of contamination, but not another. Um, one can check that although the, the Huber epsilon contamination distance isn't exactly a distance, well, these also lie inside um, the, the ball of um, uh, the, the epsilon ball measured in terms of total variation or Kolmogorov distance. Um, however, there's another, another sort of ball that one might look at, um, which is sort of uh, orthogonal in some sense. Um, and uh, this, this ball is the Wasserstein distance in the space of distributions. Uh, so here's an example that just shows how um, certain distributions, which might seem close in one distance, um, might not be close with respect to another distance. So for instance, um, if you have these two um, distributions, which are uniform and just a shift of each other, then they have a very large total variation distance because they have non-overlapping support. Um, whereas they have a small Wasserstein distance because that's like the earth mover metric. Um, and it's, it's very easy to move one distribution to the other. Um, at the other end, you might have a distribution that looks a little bit like this. So here, the purple means that um, this is common to both the red and blue distributions. And we just have um, the majority of it, of both distributions lie in this purple bulk. And then we have a little mass epsilon, um, which is here in red and here in blue. And we see that if we make um, epsilon, if we make the two um, epsilon chunks very far away, we can make the Wasserstein distance quite large, whereas the total variation distance would still be um, of order epsilon. Okay, so this is just to show that although lots of work had been done on um, estimation under Huber's epsilon contamination model, the same estimators might not perform well under Wasserstein contamination because it's a different sort of um, model of contamination. Okay, so um, this is just a reminder um, for those of you who want the technical definition of what the Wasserstein distance is. Um, and uh, it's defined in terms of these optimal couplings between the two distributions, um, P and Q. 
And in, in our case, we'll be focusing on what's called the Wasserstein one distance. And this is also known as the earth mover distance. So the questions we want to ask are um, twofold. So first of all, we want to know, well, just how good can the best estimator perform? So what are some lower bounds on rates of estimation? And secondly, um, what estimators um, exist which might, might be computationally feasible? Okay, so as a statistician, we're going to be looking at this quantity, um, which we'll define as the minimax risk. So um, if it were just a usual estimation problem with no robustness involved, you would see um, this infimum over all possible estimators theta and the supremum over um, where the true estimator theta star is. Um, however, what we have here is we allow that, um, that, the, true that the true data um, are drawn from a distribution P, which is not exactly P theta star, um, but it's going to be within an epsilon ball of the Was uh, epsilon distance um, in Wasserstein distance of P theta star. Okay, so just to, um, if, if you're familiar with the usual notion of minimax risk, that's what you would get if epsilon was equal to zero, because that would simply say that you're looking at it in, um, in a soup where it's over theta and theta star, of expected loss function between theta star and theta. Okay. Um, so, uh, well, actually, as it turns out, even though this is kind of a natural type of question to ask, um, how about what, what would you do under estimation under different um, contamination metrics, the Wasserstein model is actually largely unstudied until quite recently. Um, so there's um, a, a very long and, and very nice paper by um, Zhu Steinhardt and Jiao, Jiao from um, 2019 that analyzes the Wasserstein contamination model. Um, they look at much more general families of models. So we'll be looking at particular parametric classes, for instance, um, mean estimation in a normal family, et cetera. Um, they look at families such as, well, they look at problems such as mean estimation when you just have um, a family of distributions with bounded kth moments. Um, and I think the main difference is that um, what they focused on was the sort of population level of risk bounds. So the, the types of bounds that they have um, are assuming that, um, that n is going off to infinity, whereas we're sort of interested in, well, um, what, what is the minimax risk that you could get as a function of n and also the dimensionality p of the problem? Um, and another uh, question that was unaddressed in this work, although in some sense it was kind of more broadly focused on, on, on different, on more general classes of distributions, um, is that the work of Drew et al. did not um, address the question of coming up with computationally feasible estimators. Okay, so first we're going to talk a little bit about lower bounds. Um, so it turns out that, uh, that methods for lower bounds um, on this uh, minimax risk under Wasserstein contamination can be adapted from arguments that were proposed previously in the literature for um, Huber epsilon contamination. Um, so in that sense, the, the, the challenges for, well, it's fairly easy to derive a general theorem that gives you lower bounds. What's perhaps a little bit more difficult is to translate those bounds into um, actual, um, actual values for specific problems. So the method that, um, that is, is, is usually used in the Huber case is to look at um, what's called the modulus of continuity. And this is a notion that was introduced by Donahoe and Yu in 1988. So the modulus of continuity kind of tells you, um, it's some notion of perhaps Lipschitzness of a function. Um, and this is going to be a function of epsilon, um, at, which is uh, the, the level of contamination that we want to tolerate, as well as the parameter space theta. Um, and it's written in terms of the loss function that we're using to estimate, um, to, to, to measure accuracy of our um, estimation problem. So we look at the supremum of this loss function with, um, as a function of theta one and theta two, where theta one and theta two are two parameters from the parameter space such that the Wasserstein distance between P theta one and P theta two is within epsilon. So it's sort of a measure of confusion, if you will, um, of this problem. So just how hard, how, how confused can you be in terms of the loss function if you have two distributions that look similar, where the way that we're measuring looks similar is that the Wasserstein distances are, are within epsilon, which sort of makes sense because um, we, we in, in some sense, when we're doing robust estimation, we have um, draws from a distribution that's not quite p theta, but it's within an epsilon ball of p theta. And so if two distributions, um, p theta one and p theta two are within epsilon apart, then we also can't really distinguish them when we're drawing, um, when we're drawing samples from balls around them. Okay, so um, the theorem here, oh, why did my slides freeze? There we go, okay. Um, so the theorem here is written in the following way. Um, and so let me remind you, um, what we're interested in is this minimax risk quantity. Um, this was the inf soup um, of the expected loss function 
um, where, we're, where we're looking at estimators theta and um, the true distribution is, is P theta star. And what it says is that really there are two things you need to calculate. So one is the usual minimax risk. And as I said before, well, maybe I'll go back to the slide with the minimax risk. So um, this is what the minimax risk was. And if we put an epsilon equals zero, we have the usual minimax risk where there's no contamination, right? So there are standard methods in statistics um, and I won't, maybe I'll mention them, but I won't go through them in detail, which give you methods for, um, for coming up with lower bounds on minimax risk when there's no contamination involved. So these are methods like Fano's inequality, Lacan's method, Aswad's lemma, et cetera. Okay, so, so there are standard ways for calculating R of theta L zero. And um, what this uh, result is telling us is that um, if you calculate that, then you'll get some value. Um, and then you can calculate also the modulus of continuity separately. And if you calculate this and you take the maximum of the two, at least you'll get a lower bound on the minimax risk. And actually, surprisingly enough, in many cases, um, at least in many cases that we look at, that we've looked at, um, this turns out to be um, a tight lower bound. So we can find um, estimators which um, also achieve whatever this quantity is. Um, okay, so, uh, so yeah, what this is saying is that um, a lower bound can be obtained by taking a max of the usual and uncontaminated parametric lower bound and this modulus of continuity. So let me go through an example. So as I said, the, the theorem itself, um, well, actually there's not too much to the proof, um, especially if you know the proof for Huber contamination. Um, and secondly, the result looks very easy to write down. Um, the, the difficulty comes in trying to figure out exactly what these quantities are. So for the problem of Gaussian location estimation, um, when we have data that are coming from a normal distribution with parameter um, with, with mean theta and variance one, um, let's imagine that we're looking at the case where the loss function is the L2 loss. Um, then, as I said, there are standard methods for um, coming up with uh, with lower bounds and minimax risk um, when there's no contamination. And it turns out that um, a known lower bound is of the order of square root of P over N. So now we need to look at what this um, modulus of continuity is. And actually what we need to do is come up with a lower bound for the modulus of continuity, because what we want is we just want a lower bound on the overall minimax risk. So, um, so it turns out that one can show that a lower bound is equal to epsilon. Um, so how do we do this? Well, let me remind you what the modulus of continuity was. So let's go back there. Um, so the modulus of continuity is a soup of a soup of the loss function over all of these um, possible distributions. So that means that if we find one set of distributions um, that satisfies this argument in the soup that is of epsilon apart Wasserstein wise, we calculate the loss function on theta one and theta two, then that's certainly a lower round. So let's give an example of such distributions. Um, so imagine two distributions. Um, normal with parameter eta one and, um, and covariance i and normal with parameter eta two and covariance i such that the L2 distance is equal to epsilon. Um, so it's not too hard to see that in fact, um, the Wasserstein distance between these two distributions um, is bounded by the L2 distance between the, the two, um, between the, the, the two uh, eta one and eta two. Um, you can do this for instance, by just um, looking at an explicit formula for um, the, well, actually, you don't even need to do that. Um, you can just think about the, the standard coupling that sort of moves the, um, moves one distribution directly to the other. Um, so this gives you uh, this gives you a, a case of two distributions um, which are are in this um, which satisfy the argument of the modulus of continuity. So as we said, um, a lower bound is then just going to be the loss function applied to eta one and eta two, um, and this gives you epsilon. Okay, so as it turns out, um, well, so this is the, the result that we end up with. Um, if the family of distributions is normal with mean theta and covariance i, um, then a lower bound on the minimax risk, the contaminated minimax risk is the max of square root of p over n and epsilon. Okay, so as you can see, um, the main challenge, and of course things get more complicated if you're looking at different sorts of estimation problems, is to calculate um, this modulus of continuity or some lower bound on it. And it turns out, and this is kind of the, um, the teaser for the, for the future, that this lower bound is actually tight and can be achieved. Okay, so now let's talk about how to, um, how to come up with some estimation algorithm that will work in the case of Wasserstein contamination. So um, I'll admit that, that the, I think this next slide or two can be a little bit confusing because they're not, uh, they're a little bit hand wavy. Um, but the next slide or two is really just a uh, motivation for the estimator that we will um, we'll be studying. And the, the analysis of the estimator itself is fully rigorous. 
Okay, so um, let's uh, let's imagine that we're trying to come up with some sort of robust estimator that performs well um, under Wasserstein contamination. Um, and so, um, well, there's there's this uh, family of work on robust estimation known as distributionally robust estimation. Um, and the idea is that, well, you know, maybe you have some um, some data that are, are drawn, or you have a data set x1 up to xn, um, and pn is the empirical distribution of what you observe. Um, however, the, the, the true distribution um, that the data could have been drawn from is p theta star, where p theta star is sort of close to, to the empirical distribution, um, but not exactly equal to it. And the sort of closeness means that the two are going to be within epsilon. Um, and now you want to come up with an estimator that performs well, where um, the how well the estimator performs is measured in terms of the closeness of p theta star to p theta, um, where p theta star can again be any distribution that's within an epsilon ball of pn. Um, so this is of course going to be um, well a sort of difficult problem to look at. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a slight relaxation of it. So this is again, just a motivation. Um, so we, we could look at any distance function we wanted to. Um, imagine that we look at the Wasserstein distance just because it's easier to manipulate. So um, if we have D equal to the Wasserstein distance, then by the triangle inequality, um, we can upper bound um, this distance between P theta star and P theta by the Wasserstein distance between P theta star and PN and PN and P theta. Um, and now we also know that, um, th that by the constraint of the op optimization problem, p theta star and pn are within epsilon apart. So this is upper bounded by epsilon plus Wasserstein pn p theta. Okay, so now if we're trying to optimize um, this quantity here, well, we can ignore the epsilon and we just try to optimize the was infimum over theta of the Wasserstein distance between pn and p theta. So another way to think about it is, well, at, uh, what, what we've arrived at at the end of the day is sort of some sort of projection problem, which also on some, you know, loosey-goosey intuitive sense makes some sense that, you know, you, you, you observe this empirical distribution PN um, and you want to come up with a good estimate theta um, and you, you kind of want to project it onto the, the theta space. Um, and in what sense do you do it? Well, perhaps the Wasserstein distance because we're measuring everything in terms of Wasserstein distance anyway. Okay. So, so, so clarify. Yeah. So, uh -huh. so um, the xi's are these drawn from the distribution p theta? Um, well, so not not necessarily. Um, I mean, well, I, I guess. Uh, I mean, in. I mean, as I said, this is sort of just a motivation. Um, so, it, in some sense, um, what are we doing? Well, yeah, I mean, not necessarily. So we, we, yeah, I mean, well, at the end of the day, we'll make this a little bit more explicit, but um, this is kind of, this is saying that, um, so P theta here is the, is the estimator, right? And we're measuring the distance between P theta and, um, and any possible P theta star. So the data in some sense are being drawn from a P theta star where P theta star is anything that's within an epsilon distance of PN. Okay, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, don't don't think too hard about this motivation here. Okay, so um, so so we arrive at this problem, um, and and now you can ask yourself, well, okay, this is a nice optimization problem, but how do you actually solve it? Um, and that's going to be quite difficult, right? Because you're trying to do some sort of projection um, under the Wasserstein distance. Um, so this is where uh, the the framework of um, neural networks comes in useful. So it turns out, and those of you who are um, experts in neural networks will, will realize this right away, um, that this is exactly the problem that um, is solved by generative adversarial networks. So let me remind you of um, this framework of GANs. Um, so generally, when you talk about a GAN, you have um, a generator and you have a discriminator. Um, and you're trying to train both networks at the same time. And what you're trying to, to learn is, well, you're trying to find a way to um, to generate fake data in some sense that matches um, the, the distribution of the input data X. And the discriminator is supposed to be able to tell you um, whether or not the data came from the generator um, or from the, the, the true input distribution X. So there's a way of um, recasting this problem that um, is being solved as the, by the GAN um, as a minimax optimization problem, as some sort of adversarial game um, between the generator and the discriminator. 
Um, if you, there, there's also a way of, of recasting um, this objective function in the following way. So it turns out that if you, um, if you, if you fix the, the G and you optimize just over D, then you can actually solve explicitly for what the, um, what the inner part of the objective is doing. Um, and this can be written as just an infimum over G of what's known as the Jensen-Shannon divergence between um, P theta star and Q, where Q is the distribution of the generator. So in some sense, this is also kind of doing a projection. Um, and it, what it's doing is it's projecting um, the, the data that are coming from the generator um, onto the space of, uh, of parametric distributions, P theta star. So, um, so during training, um, P theta star is, is replaced by the empirical distribution Pn. Um, and what we see then is that we're trying to minimize um, the Jensen-Shannon divergence between um, Pn and P theta. So um, in, of course, in, in ML applications, um, one doesn't really necessarily think about the, um, the GAN as being a, a projection method. Um, instead, one is much more interested in the, in the distribution G of Z, because this gives us a way of, um, of generating fake data that look a lot like the, the, the distribution of the input X. Um, also in, in ML applications, um, people have looked at other distance measures. And um, because, well, you could ask the same question, you know, what's special about this sort of Jensen-Shannon divergence? What if I use some other, um, some other function or some, some other uh, measure of distance instead? Um, and in, in fact, in, in practice, um, there are some drawbacks of, um, of using Jensen-Shannon divergence. So people have studied other sorts of um, metrics such as F, F divergences leading to F GANs. Um, of course, in, in the title of, of this talk, I mentioned W GANs, um, and that's exactly what we're going to use. So it, it, along the same lines, um, if you replace this Jensen-Shannon divergence by a Wasserstein distance, um, then you end up with this problem. So what you want to do is you want to take the infimum over theta of the Wasserstein distance um, between the uh, observed distribution Pn and, um, and the distribution P theta. Okay, so how is this actually done in practice? Well, let me remind you of, um, of another uh, characterization of the Wasserstein distance. Um, so the, the, the Wasserstein distance can also be written in this form. Um, it's going to be a supremum over the expectation of f of x um, taken over pn minus the expectation of f of x taken over p theta, where we let f be the set of all um, L Lipschitz functions, uh, sorry, of all one Lipschitz functions. Um, and, um, and it turns out that, um, that one can uh, then try to implement this um, as a neural network. Um, and this is, the, um, uh, this is exactly the objective function that we saw earlier. Okay, so the point is that um, one can actually try to optimize the objective function that I introduced earlier, albeit the, I haven't yet told you that this objective function sort of rigorously makes sense, um, but at least um, one can try to then optimize this um, using a GAN. Okay, so uh, maybe there, there are sort of two, two small clarifications I want to make. So first of all, um, yes, I will show you rigorously why this works. And secondly, um, what, we're, what we've done is we've um, come up with an estimator that we want to now um, optimize using a Wasserstein GAN. And at the end of the day, the claim is that this is a computationally tractable algorithm. Um, however, as we all know, the theory of, um, of neural networks and optimization of neural networks is still sort of in the works, right? So this is, um, so what we're claiming is that the Wasserstein GAN can be used to optimize this problem um, under the assumption that the Wasserstein GAN can actually find the global optimum that we're looking for. Um, and, and that's um, one small part in the theory that, um, I guess I'll comment on this in the, in the conclusion slide, but is, is still not exactly um, clear. Okay. Um, so, uh, so one more, um, one more comment is that actually this isn't, this isn't exactly what we're going to solve. Um, so, um, the problem is that in fact, um, even if, if PN, um, were, uh, well, I mean, the point is that, um, PN doesn't actually converge that quickly to the true distribution, um, P, P theta star. Um, so we, we don't actually want to exactly optimize that objective function, but what we're going to optimize is, um, is, is this slightly relaxed objective. So instead of looking at, um, at all uh, one Lipschitz functions, um, as, I, as I mentioned in the previous slide, um, what we're going to be optimizing is um, over a subset of one Lipschitz functions. So let me go back here. So, um, so, so the objective function that I said we were interested in was the infimum over theta of this expectation 
difference in expectations where we're going over all one Lipschitz functions, but what we're going to do is just optimize over a subset of these one Lipschitz functions. Um, and, uh, and the last thing is, well, if you look at what I wrote on this slide, I said B Lipschitz functions. Okay, so, um, so there's a reason for this. When we're actually um, studying this estimator, we might want to not just look at one Lipschitz functions, but B Lipschitz functions. But by the same duality result, you could also write this as, um, as, as a B with a, a scaling of one over B in the front and it wouldn't make a difference. Okay, um, so yeah, so, so this is the estimator that we're now going to rigorously study. Okay, so if, I mean, I know I might've been a bit confusing in terms of the motivation of how we got to this objective, but now we have an objective function. Um, that we um, that we we hope um, can actually be optimized using a Wasserstein GAN, and now we're going to study the properties of um, of what of, of uh, the rates of estimation of this data hat. Okay, so um, so it's important to to mention some related work that was um, largely the inspiration for this. Um, so in in 2018, there was a paper by Chao Gao and co-authors. Um, who looked at using the what's called the total variation GAN um, as a method for location estimation in the Huber epsilon contamination model? Um, so, uh, so even in uh, in the case of Huber's epsilon contamination model, if you're just looking at location estimation, um, there were some issues of computational tractability that um, that have remained open for a while, and. Um, and an estimator, which um, is known to perform optimally well, known as the Tukey median, is also very hard to compute when you are in high dimensions. So um, Gao et al. proposed to use this, uh, to use the GAN as a workhorse um, in this setting um, to, to, come up with, um, uh, to come up with an estimator which performs as well as the Tukey median um, in, in the case of Huber epsilon contamination. So what we were interested in was asking if we used a different contamination model, such as Wasserstein contamination, um, can we then use a GAN that matches um, in, in some sense using a Wasserstein GAN in order to get um, optimal rates as well. Okay, um, there, were, there were some extensions in the literature um, to covariance matrix estimation um, by, by Gao and co-authors as well, and also sparse location estimation in, in a paper in 2020 by Wu et al. Um, going back to this paper that I mentioned by Ju Steinhardt and Jiao from 2019, where they um, where they mostly focused on um, on population level um, minimax risk of of different estimators, um, they also look at a projection of the um, of the observed distribution with respect to some sort of weakened Wasserstein distance. Um, and their weakened Wasserstein distance is also a different subset of a set of Lipschitz functions. Um, but just to reiterate, um, they, they didn't look at optimality of their estimator or computational tractability. Okay, so let's go back to um, trying to justify the, um, the uh, justify our estimator and look at its performances rigorously. So, um, so as I mentioned that we're going to look at, um, at, at, at some subset of B Lipschitz functions, not all Lipschitz, not all B Lipschitz functions. Um, and it turns out that the, well, the, the subset of B Lipschitz functions that we're going to look at are defined in the following way. Um, so remember that, um, that we have a neural network that we're using here. Um, and so we want to, um, to construct a neural network that will give us this B Lipschitz property. And the way that the neural network um, is described is that it has, um, it has some number of inner layers, which all have um, ReLU activations. And the first layer has a sigmoid act activation, and then the output layer is linear. And the reason why we make the output layer linear is that we, um, we want the function class to be symmetric for technical reasons, that if f is, um, is in this function class, then negative f is as well. Um, and um, because of these constraints that we have in terms of the L2 norm um, on the first layer and the L1 norm of the weights in in, um, in succeeding layers, one can show that in fact, this is going to be a subset of the class of B Lipschitz function. Okay, and we're going to um, let D of BL can, um, denote the class of functions that are, that are realizable by this family of Wasserstein GANs. Okay, so now we want to understand um, the performance of this estimator theta hat, which we've defined in terms of, um, of, of minimizing over this function class. Um, and, and what we need to start with is a uniform concentration result on the functions in this class. Um, and, and using standard techniques, one can um, show that, in fact, the, the supremum over the empirical average minus the expectation is bounded by, um, by a quantity of, of this form um, with high probability where the, where the XIs are, are drawn from a distribution P. 
Um, and what this can get you is, is the following. So um, by, by a little bit of manipulation of this um, concentration inequality, you can come up with, um, with this bound that says that the, the supremum over um, all functions in this class of the difference between the expectation under P theta star and the expectation under the optimal theta hat um, is bounded by um, this quantity on the right side. Okay. Um, and, um, and, and this is where theta hat is, is the estimator that, um, that we've defined earlier. Um, so, so the challenge now is um, if, if we have this high probability upper bound um, on deviations, in some sense, this is a, a bound on, on deviations between theta star and theta hat. But now for different problems of interest, we need to translate it into a bound on, on theta hat minus theta star, which is the um, which is the, uh, the the error. Well, I mean, if we're looking at L2 norm, then the, the L2 norm between theta hat and theta star is, is the quantity of interest that we want to bound. Okay. So let me um, go through an example here. Um, so um, imagine that we're in a case where, um, where, where we're looking at location estimation again, um, where P theta star is, um, is normal with mean theta star and covariance I. Um, then, the, then the result that we have is the following. Um, so it says that if we have data which are drawn from um, a distribution P, um, which is within a Wasserstein distance epsilon of um, P theta star, um, if we have also certain um, conditions on the sample size, um, then the, the Wasserstein GAN estimator um, it is going to satisfy this bound with high probability um, that is bounded by two to the L times square root P over N uh, maximum with epsilon. Okay, so um, what is L? Well, this is kind of a loaded question. So L is the number of layers um, in our neural network implementation. Um, so if we, if we think about L as a constant, then really this is saying that um, we sort of need the number of samples to be bigger than, um, than a constant times P, which is, you know, you can, you can live with that, right? I mean, that's what you would have in the usual parametric rates. Um, and in, in that sense, um, well, yeah, so in, in that sense, I think I wrote this as optimal. Yeah, Th this result is, is actually minimax optimal. So if you think about L as, as a constant that we're, we're not going to pay too much attention to, then, um, then the Wasserstein GAN estimator is giving us um, an upper bound of the form max between square root P over N and epsilon. And this is the, the same um, bound that I derived earlier for you via this modulus of continuity argument. Okay, um, but the, the one thing that, that's a little bit concerning perhaps is that um, this bound that we've written down increases with L and not in a very pretty way. Um, and um, it, it kind of, perhaps runs a little bit uh, contrary to your initial in intuition. So your initial intuition should tell you that for neural networks, we want um, deeper neural networks in general, um, and, and those lead to better performance, right? Um, and what this is telling us is that if we want to have bounds that are the tightest possible according to our theory, then we should just let L be equal to one. So the depth of our neural network should just be one. Um, and, and, and actually the, well, so, so to, to respond to this, um, this seeming paradox. So the reason why the bound increases with L mathematically kind of makes sense. Um, and this goes back to where these bounds are coming from. Well, at some point we want to look at uniform concentration um, of these uh, over this function class uh, where the function class is defined in terms of B Lipschitz functions. Um, and we have the number of layers in the neural network L. So if L gets larger, then the class gets bigger. So it sort of makes sense that the uniform concentration bounds get worse and worse. Um, so, so then what do we do with, with the fact that, um, that larger neural networks are supposed to have better approximation guarantees and, uh, and should perform better? Well, in some sense, um, yes, it's true that, that if the number of layers is larger, um, then the neural network should have better approximation guarantees. But remember that we actually wanted some sort of relaxation, right? So in some sense, um, when I went, when I was uh, looking back here at this relaxation, I said that we didn't actually want a supremum over all B Lipschitz functions. Um, if we have a supremum over all B Lipschitz functions, then the, then the performance of the estimator is actually not quite as good. Um, we want to look at a smaller class. And, um, and that's perhaps one way of looking at um, why this theory, the theoretical result is telling us that in fact, um, in order to get um, these, uh, these estimators of, the, of optimal order, um, really, we, we just want to look at a small number of layers rather than a large number. 
Okay, so hopefully that kind of explains things a little bit. Um, we were also a bit puzzled at first when we were deriving these results. Um, okay, so just um, a little bit of um, and a little bit of insight into this proof. So earlier I said that um, we had uh, we had this upper bound on deviations between theta star and theta hat measured in terms of this kind of weird looking quantity. Um, and what we want to do is we now need to translate these the bounds that we have um, in general on, on this quantity into the L2 distance between theta star and theta hat. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we can of course look at a specific value of f. Um, so if we look at a particular f, then of course um, that, that will be upper bounded by, by the suprema. Okay, so what f are we going to look at? Well, we're allowed to look at um, any f that's represented by um, a neural network in our class, right? So we're gonna look at a very simple one. Okay, so our, our neural network is um, allowing us to choose, um, to choose any weights we want, as long as the, um, the, the L2 norm in the first layer is bounded by B, and then the L1 norm is bounded by one and so on. Um, so what we're going to do is um, we're just going to, uh, to choose these, um, these neural network weights so that we only focus on, um, on, on these uh, on connections to the first node here. And, um, and this node is going to be computed as um, U transpose X minus U transpose theta star, um, of course, with the, with the sigmoid function wrapped around it. Okay, um, and we, we need to make sure that um, that the, the L2 norm of, of U is bounded by B um, because that's what, what we require for our, um, in, in our, our first layer of activations. And after that, we're just going to, to pass um, everything through um, just as, as the identity. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, well, at the end of the day, the output is actually just going to be equal to, um, to the sigmoid um, uh, applied to U transpose X minus theta star. So the reason being that um, for a ReLU function, if you're in the positive part of the um, of, of the plane, then um, then it's just equal to the identity. So the output of the sigmoid is always something positive, and then if you pass it through some values, then it just passes along the identity. Okay, so so we have a particular function um, which is inside our class, and and now we know that um, if we look at uh, at this particular function, then um, then then this different the difference should be upper bounded by the supremum. Okay, so. Um, so now we look at the at what the expectation is um, uh, of this function f of x. Um, remember, the function that we've now um, implemented was um, the sigmoid function applied to u transpose x minus theta star. Um, and now this is something that one can actually explicitly write down. So remember that these um, x's are coming from a Gaussian family, um, and and we we know what the form of the sigmoid is. So the expectation can be written as an integral. So this is just um, some other function, some fixed function g that we can compute of u transpose um, theta minus theta star. Okay, and, and the main property that's important is that this function g is, it turns out to be locally Lipschitz around zero. Okay, so what that means for us is that, um, so, um, so now we're, we're looking at, uh, at this difference at the supremum, which we knew was upper bounded by, by the, the expression that I wrote earlier. Um, this upper bounds um, this supremum, where we're looking at um, g of zero minus g of u transpose theta hat minus theta star. Um, and now we're also looking at a supremum over all possible u's um, of, with L2 norm equal to b. Um, and the local Lipschitz property then tells us that we can further lower bound um, the left-hand side, um, basically in terms of, 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 these, um, of these L2 norms. Okay, um, and, and this is what gives us um, at the end of the day, an upper bound on the L2 norm of theta hat minus theta star um, in terms of, of, uh, of the general upper bound that, that I had derived um, via uniform concentration on the, the supremum of the expectation under P theta star minus, minus expectation for P theta hat. Okay, so that's, um, that's generally how the, the proof works. Um, of course, again, this is for a very specific problem of, um, of normal location family, um, of, of uh, Location estimation under a normal family, and um, and the challenge that that we had to face in um, in looking at at other estimation problems was in translating this upper bound um, to an appropriate bound on on the the parameters. Um, okay, so um, so now I'm just going to kind of give you a couple results that we um, that that we further derive for different um, estimation problems without going through the details as much. So. Um, we also looked at the problem of covariance matrix estimation. 
Um, I guess this should be p sigma star. Um, so, so here we, we assume that we have um, uh, we have data from a normal distribution with mean zero and covariance matrix sigma star, um, and we want to estimate sigma star. Um, we ended up needing to put some bounds, of course, on our um, on our parameter space. So um, here we're interested in these well-conditioned matrices um, that have uh, minimum and maximum eigenvalue that are bounded. Um, and, uh, and, and the discriminator is going to, again, come from the class of neural network uh, models that I described before. Um, so just to, um, just to clarify a little bit, so maybe I wasn't so clear about the discriminator versus the generator. So the way that the, the neural network, um, the, the way that the GAN is set up, it's this game between the discriminator and the generator. Um, and the, there is an infimum and a supremum, and the supremum is, um, is what the discriminator is doing, which is why the supremum over F corresponds to the, the neural network models that are implemented with the structure that I described. Um, and then in terms of the generator, because when we actually implement this, um, we need to have both networks. So the, um, the generator, so, so this is to clarify the difference between, um, between uh, estimating the location of, um, of a normal family and estimating the covariance matrix. So for location estimation, the generator is just a very simple generator that says that we, we take our um, whatever the, the input theta is, and we, um, and, and we just um, we use this as a shift to, um, to a standard normal distribution. Um, for covariance estimation, what we would have is we would be um, taking a matrix A multiplied by, um, by the standard normal, because that's giving us the stretch. And the, the final estimator then in that case is going to be um, whatever, um, whatever theta shift is, is estimated in the case of um, of, of this uh, location um, problem. And in the case of the covariance problem, it would be A times A transpose. Okay, so the, um, so the theorem that, um, that we derived here is um, in the setting where we have um, IID data from, uh, from an epsilon, uh, fr from a distribution which is within an epsilon ball of um, P sigma star. And we have a similar sort of um, condition that we, well, if you, if you imagine as L being something fixed, the number of layers, then we need N to be roughly on the order of P. Um, so now um, if, you, if you implement this Wasserstein GAN and find an optimum, um, then the, uh, the spectral norm bound um, will with high probability be bounded by square root of P over N max with, with epsilon. Um, and here's an example of where we actually need the power of, of B. So, um, uh, instead of just looking at one Lipschitz functions, we want to look at B Lipschitz functions, where B is is this um, is this one over m one, which showed up in, in the definition of our parameter space. Okay, um, and uh, and and I won't go through the details, but um, by looking at the this lower bound verse via a, a modulus of continuity argument, um, one can also show that this uh, square root p over n max with epsilon is is a minimax optimal rate. Okay. Um, then there is uh, the question of putting some, some structural constraints on, on the estimation problem. So um, you might be interested in the question of sparse location estimation. Um, what if I'm doing um, estimation of, of a mean in a normal location family um, where, where theta star is known to be sparse? Um, so uh, of course you could do the same thing that, um, you could use the same estimator that you would if it weren't sparse, but you wouldn't end up with optimal rates because the rates of estimation um, are going to be a little bit better um, when, when you have a, a slightly smaller when you have a when you ha are in this um, sparse parameter space. Um, and in order to to get the better rates, um, you have to use a slightly different neural network. Um, and the way that that the neural network is defined now um, is in terms of these um, these k sparse weights. Okay, so it turns out that if you um, if you look at a neural network where the, the first layer not only has L2 norm that's bounded by B, but also has, um, has um, L0 norm bounded by K, um, then you can end up with, um, with rates of this form. So what we have is now um, K times log P over K over N max with epsilon. Um, and it turns out that this is minimax optimal. If, um, if any of you work on the problem of, of sparse um, mean estimation, you'll recognize that, that this is the rate that you, that you should get. Well, what, what you'll recognize is that in the non-robust case, you would see this square root of k log p over k over n term. Okay. Um, for covariance matrix estimation, one can also look at some sort of structure, and I won't go through the details here. Um, but you can um, you can also adapt the um, the 
um, the structure of your um, of your neural network estimator to end up with um, with rates that turn out to be minimax. Okay. Um, then the question that we sort of only partially addressed, um, but uh, ha have some open questions here, um, is for linear regression. So you might ask, well, what if you have um, a linear model and the xi's are drawn from a normal distribution with mean zero and covariance sigma star, um, and the yi's given xi's are drawn from um, from this uh, normal distribution. So basically, the um, the errors are going to be independent standard normal. Um, and the goal is to estimate beta star from IID samples from this joint distribution, where now um, the joint distribution is within the epsilon Wasserstein ball of, um, of, the, the, joint dis of, the, of the true clean joint distribution of the x's and y's. Okay, um, so basically in this case, what we came up with was non-matching upper and lower bounds. So the question that we have is, well, we're not really sure um, what exactly is optimal. Um, so let's look at what these bounds look like. Well, um, so here the parameter space is going to be constrained a little bit so that the, um, the covariance matrix is, is well conditioned and we have an L2 upper bound on, on beta. Um, and the upper bound we were able to obtain using our Wasserstein GAN estimators was order of um, square root P over N max with epsilon. Um, whereas for the lower bounds via modulus of continuity, we have um, P over N max with epsilon. Okay, so in terms of the, the, the impact of the contamination level epsilon, they match, um, but in terms of um, the dependence on N um, and P, um, there's a gap between the bounds. Okay, um, so we, we didn't really do very much with implementation. Um, this is mostly a theoretical paper, um, but we looked at, uh, I, I think what I have here is just a very small comparison um, of the Wasserstein GAN estimator compared with the Huber estimator. Um, compared with the sample mean. So of course the sample mean loses out big time. So what you see here is, um, is these very large blue numbers um, for a sample mean under contaminated distributions. Um, I, I think the, the summary of, of what we found in our, in our simulations was that um, if you have a, a Huber epsilon contamination ball, at least when we looked at a mixture of normal and some heavy tailed distributions, um, the Wasserstein GAN um, ended up performing well or sometimes even better than the Huber estimator. And then of course, when we looked at some settings where we had um, a distribution that was within the Wasserstein epsilon contamination ball, but way out of the Huber epsilon contamination ball, then Huber's estimator did badly, whereas our estimator did well. Um, okay, so, um, so we have some open questions. Um, the first one, which of course, um, as a theoretician, uh, you, it worries you when there's kind of a little gap in the, in the logic. So again, the, the one main gap in this is that we are assuming that the Wasserstein GAN can in fact find us the global optimum of this objective function. Um, now, I think that there's a lot of evidence in, um, in, in neural network training um, to see that, in fact, in many cases, one can find a global optimum. Um, but of course, what we're, what we're using is, what we're assuming is that the, the Wasserstein GAN can be used, can indeed be used as this workhorse that will give us um, a global optimum. Um, then some kind of slightly more specific questions. Um, well, of course, in, in linear regression, what exactly are the minimax optimal rates? Because our, our upper and lower bounds didn't match. Um, in the case of, of linear regression with structural constraints, um, what if you have sparse linear regression? So we could find ways to, um, to, to get um, rate optimal estimators for um, sparse location estimation and sparse covariance estimation, but in linear regression, we're not quite sure how to incorporate that in our estimator. And then also another technical um, condition was that, um, so there are various, uh, various constraints that I kind of threw in here and there, like in linear regression and um, an L2 norm upper bound on the parameter or uh, minimum and maximum eigenvalue conditions on the covariance matrices. And the reason that, that these were thrown in was basically to get from this, um, this uh, general um, uniform concentration result to um, to some uh, to use that to upper bound something like the L2 norm of theta hat minus theta star or the spectral norm of um, sigma hat minus sigma star. And it's not exactly clear whether or not all these constraints are actually necessary. Um, okay, well, thanks a lot for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions.